our study today of the fourth chapter of Acts. Uh, once again, I remind you that these uh, are available, both the video and the uh, PowerPoints. If you will make a request for the PowerPoints, I'll be glad to uh, send you that information. Uh, again, this is a gem-packed chapter, and of course, our title is Emboldened, uh, and we find that uh, Peter preaches to the Jewish leaders in this particular chapter, despite the fact that they were threatened by the authorities, they were arrested, and they continued to uh, share the message of the resurrection, and it began to spread and grow among the people there. So as we move forward, I will have a lots of arrows uh, that are pointing to particular uh, words and thoughts that I want to share. Uh, I just want you, don't want you to think that uh, war has bro broke out with the Indians and they're shooting arrows at us. Uh, this chapter helps us see the work of the Holy Spirit that began earlier in the text, as now we see how the Holy Spirit is working to embolden and strengthen uh, Peter and John, as well as the church. They face threatenings that uh, uh, are growing, or like that which is the growing in our world, in particular in our country, to those who name the name of Christ. And this will help us as we study this lesson to see what they face and to be aware that of what God can do uh, to embolden, up, embolden us as we continue to share uh, our faith with others. Uh, Acts 4.1, while they were speaking to the people, the priest, the captain of the, captain of the temple police, and the Sadducees confronted them. Now, later we'll see more of those people who I consider to be among the elite threatening, and I believe it has been counted, and there are as many as seven different groups that are threatening John and Peter as they preach the gospel. Verse 2, because they were annoyed, that we, they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Now, introduced here is a group that I'll speak about later as well, named the Sadducees. There were two political parties. They were the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and intertwined uh, their uh, leadership is inter intertwined with the government, with the Jewish uh, Senate uh, temple there. And so all of this is mixed together as far as their leadership. One of the main differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees is that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And this little pun, pun, pun may help you remember that, because they did not believe in the resurrection, they were sad, you see. So they should have been sad not to be able to claim the power of the risen Christ, but they objected heavily uh, to the preaching and teaching of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And so they are marked, just as the Pharisees, with certain kinds of uh, traits and leadership, but that's one of the main ones. Verse 3, so they seized them and took them into custody until the next day, since it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. As you know, in that day, whenever numbers were given of groups, generally it was just the men who were named as 
uh, they would name the soldiers in battle or a company of soldiers. However, uh, when you think about that, you can double that and maybe even triple and maybe even quadruple that to uh, name the number of people who were part of the following of Christ. That's quite an increase from uh, the day of Pentecost when there were 3,000 who believed. Now we are at 5,000 and growing. And uh, the, these people will make a difference, as we will see as we move forward with our uh, study uh, of this text. Here, we want to simply reflect on what uh, just occurred. That was Peter and John were arrested for teaching about Jesus and the res resurrection. The Jewish leaders questioned the apostles, demanding to know what power they were using. And despite the threats, the apostles uh, uh, released them only uh, after they kept them for uh, a short time. So uh, the people made a difference in their outcry regarding what had occurred. The next day, their rulers and elders and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Ananias. Uh, at Annas is here. Is he's also known as Ananias, and uh, there's one other name given for the high high priest. Now there were seventy one uh, Sadducees, and of course then the Pharisees. But he was a high priest, uh, and, uh, and and then there was Caiaphas, then John. Alexander and all the members of the high priestly family. Now, the high priestly family was a combination of all these leaders and people. You might call them the elite, and you would have to say these were the religious elite. And they seemed to control and have power over people in regards to what they could say and what they could do. Verse 7, uh, I think, clarifies what they were facing. After that, had, after they had Peter and John stand before them, now they had them stand as criminals before a court of law, they began to question them, by what power or in what name have you done this? Of course, they wanted them to always do whatever they did in the, the highest power of government, the highest power of the religious elements. But they were wondering, who gave you the authorities to say or to do these things? And they were not at all bashful in telling them. Peter goes back to the day of Pentecost, and he said, then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, it appears that this is a, a an extra filling of the Spirit at that moment in, at a time when he was needing an extra boost. It's almost like a, a, a pneumatic tire that goes flat and then that pneumatic tire fills up. And of course, the word spirit comes from that rare root word and that emboldened Peter. And he said to them, uh, rulers of the people, uh, to said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if you are being examined today, exam examined today, about a good deed done to a disabled man by what means he was healed. Let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name 
of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, you recall it was said of Jesus, what good can come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was not a well-respected community. And, of course, that was where Jesus made his home for 30 years and working with his father, uh, as the scriptures call him, a carpenter. But the word itself better describes person who does all kinds of work of that nature. And mostly he worked with stones because, you know, in that day or in that region of the land, there were not a lot of wood. So he likely was more a stonemason, a handyman, uh, than working specifically uh, with wood. But, of course, there was some wood. But, of course, he brings up the name of Jesus, and then he once again punches them in the gut when he said, whom you crucified, you are the ones who tried to destroy him by killing him, thinking that by killing him, you would end what he had to say. And then he quickly moves and says, but God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing here before you healthy. In that brief statement, he is declaring that it is because of the risen Christ that this man could be empowered and healed and stand healthy. And of course, whenever they heard this man's name mentioned, which we don't know who he was, but he had been at the gate beautiful every day asking for alms. And he had was a, uh, a paralytic. He was lame from his birth. Everyone knew him. They knew his condition. And then they are able to see the evidence of God working to heal him. It's an undeniable fact. It is based on evidence. That's what our faith is based on. It is based on multiple ways that we can give evidence of what God has done. Then verse 11 reveals to us, uh, I think, one of the most powerful aspects of this story. This Jesus is the stone rejected by your builders, which has become the cornerstone. Now, in the next few slides, I'm going to show you how the Jews had their own answer to uh, who this cornerstone is. And uh, so that's to me, a very interesting le legend that comes from the Jewish people themselves. Then he says to them what we all know, and that is there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved, indicating that Caesar, the high priestly family, or anyone else that you can name are not providing salvation. It is coming through that cornerstone and uh, no, no one else delivers that. It is the name of Jesus Christ. Peter made that clear uh, as he healed this man in the name of Jesus, emphasizing that this was a miracle of divine authority and power. And he uh, states that more than once, that it was not his power that brought about the healing, but it was the power that came through Jesus Christ in the evidence of the Holy Spirit that filled them and emboldened them to preach the gospel. Salvation is in no one else. And then he quotes from the psalmist who declares that Jesus is that cornerstone years before as he quotes David's song, psalm to them. And they hear the very words out of their only own 
uh, scripture that they they read, which they call the Tanakh, uh, which is uh, an expansion beyond the Torah, which is the first five books into the Bible that we know as uh, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Testament. It's uh, a book that contains all the books that we have, but in a different order. And that itself is a wonderful study. But imagine them talking about this cornerstone. Look how large this is. This stone weighs uh, tons and tons. And it's one of the features of the Holy Land, like uh, Stonehenge, like the uh, Machu Picchu in South America and Peruvian area. Uh, where the Indians built large complexes that still troubled the minds of people trying to figure out how they did that. But he says that this cornerstone was rejected. Now, this uh, has another picture showing you how large that stone is. And here is the description uh, that the Jews, it's a legend, but I think it's worthy of us uh, mentioning. They had this explana uh, expla explanation that when Solomon was building his temple, which took seven years to build, that they would uh, quarry these large stones in another place and they would be delivered to those who were putting them in place at the temple. One day they had a stone delivered that didn't fit where they had measured. And they figured that the quarry had made a mistake. And so it was put to the side, eventually was rolled down into the Kidron Valley. And uh, so it lay there for years until finally they got to the completing date and they were looking for that cornerstone the one to fit everything together and as they were looking for it they could not find it so they sent word back to the quarry and asked the question where is the capstone the cornerstone and word came back you have it we delivered it many years ago someone uh, one of the workers remembered that stone that lay at the bottom of Kedron Valley, went down and they began to pull the debris from it and discovered it was the one that they had prepared, but yet it was the one that they had rejected, and it was that cornerstone. And when they lifted it out of the valley and put it in place, it fit perfectly. And that is their legend, which describes that uh, that cornerstone, which Jesus is declared to be the cornerstone, the one that was rejected. Simon Peter, because of uh, the spirit coming into his life, was and began to be very bold. Verse 13 says, when they observed, observed Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained. Untrained, bold men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. It's so important for us to stand what God and how God uses people. We are not necessarily educated in order to do the work of ministry. But if we spend our time with Jesus and have been filled with the Spirit of God, he can use people of all educations, educated levels. When you study even the recent history of Christianity in America, Many people who were untrained and unlearned, God used in a wonderful way. I've known of men who could not read and had someone else to read the scriptures 
but they were able to speak out of that because of their walk with God and deliver a needed message to a congregation. So God gave them boldness so that the people took note that something special was in at work in these men. Verse 14, and since they saw the man who had been healed, that is the lame man who was lame from birth, standing, when they saw him healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. That is the power of the witness of a life that has been changed because God has made that change. Outwardly, this man was changed and was given strength and power that he had not had prior to. So outwardly, it was a demonstration of God's power. But let me also say that there are many people like Simon Peter who inwardly have been strengthened by the Spirit of God so that the very nature that they have, maybe being shy, maybe feeling inferior, etc., that God is able to strengthen men and women to stand in places that they otherwise wise would not have been able to, apart from the filling of the Spirit and the emboldening power that God gives those who trust him. And then verse 15 says, and after they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, that is, they wanted them away from uh, where they were being held uh, in, in, and had been arrested and placed before. And when they left, they conferred among themselves, themselves. They got in a huddle and began to ask themselves, what are we going to do? And verse six, 16 reveals, as they said, uh, say, what should we do with these men? Here, remember, they were talking about the resurrection from the dead, which was opposed by the Sadducees. The Pharisees had no problem with the resurrection. And then they say, for an obvious sign has been done through them. And they had to admit that it was clear to everyone living in Jerusalem. How can you deny a man who had been lame, walking in their midst and doing things for himself that he could not do prior to what Jesus did when he performed the first miracle that we see in the book of Acts. And they come to the conclusion that I, the only conclusion I figured they could come to is that we cannot deny it. When people see uh, a man changed from an alcoholic, changed from a person who is a liar, a person who is a thief, a person who is abusive, on and on I could go to describe those things that are, are evident when we do not walk with God. When they see that change in your life and mine, that it is clear, it is undeniable. That is our greatest witness. To me, as I've said earlier, the power of the resurrection is no clearer, nor, believe, nor, nor more believable when people see the evidence in our lives when these things occur. Verse 17, but so that this does not spread any further among the people, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone uh, else in this his this name again, so that was what they was up they were up against. We are up against the same thing today. People will make fun of Christians, but I have been emboldened by people that I listen to each day, very educated people who have stood in the face of that kind of opposition and have boldly spoken the truth out of their own knowledge, but more so out of their own experience of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Verse 18, 
So they called for them and ordered them, ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Christ. Now, before I move forward, do you think that had any difference in Simon, Peter, and John? You think that kept them from speaking? Well, we'll see very quickly that it had no effect on them. Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. <laughs> and then they continued. For we are unable to stop speaking. That's like saying to a, a father and mother who just had a new child born. That's like telling them, don't tell anybody about this child or a grandparent. Uh, don't say anything about this joy of your life. Or I read a story years ago about gold miners that everybody in the gold rush were looking to make their fortune. A man discovered gold in a region that he had claimed for himself, and he knew he had to go back and register that claim so that he could claim it for himself. But if he told someone, he knew that uh, he could not get his land registered and verified before it would be inundated with people coming to find their gold as well. So they made an agreement to go back in town, in the town where they registered their land and their gold mine without saying anything to anybody. But as they went into town, they went directly to the or office, they made their registration, they went back to their region and saw that it was filled with people who had made their way there. And someone asked the, those who made the discovery, did anybody tell anybody about our gold mine find? They said, we told no one. And he asked someone had made their way there to get gold for themselves. Why did you come here? And they said, we could see the glow on your face. And we, we saw the glow on your face. We know and we knew that you had made a great discovery. Well, that's precisely uh, what happened to these men. Nobody could keep them from speaking about what they had seen and what they heard. And I would add to that what they experience and they and they began to try to stop them verse 21 after threatening them further they released them what did they do when they risked release them they found no way to punish them because the people were all giving glory to god over what they had done we need to be reminded that the voice of the people in any uh, group has a voice that must be heard. Even in our predicaments, predic predicaments in our pol political realm, it's the people who have the last word. In this story, it is because they were giving glory to God to whom it belongs, and they knew God was the strength behind all that was happening. And then verse 22, for this sign of healing uh, had been performed on a man over 40 years old. 40 years he had been a lame man sitting there at the Yea, beautiful, begging for an offering because he had no way to make a living because of his paralytic condition. Here this man stood them as evidence of what God can do. They were emboldened by what God did, and they were, as verse 23 says, they were released. They went to their own people 
and reported everything the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, Master, you are the one who made heaven, the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father David, your servant, the kings of the earth take their stand and the ruler the rulers assemble against against the Lord and against the Messiah. For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel and everyone assemble together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. This war passage is filled with against three times against the Lord, against his Messiah, against your Holy Spirit or Holy Servant Jesus. Each of them designating Jesus as the, the one they were against, even though it was Peter and John who were telling the message, they were saying, this is what they say against you. And then he goes to on to say and use a word that is a word that I will not have time here to explain fully. Uh, he said, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. I think in this particular passage he is talking about being predetermined this is the plan of god being uh fulfilled open before them and he is saying this is what has been determined predetermined we know that people are going to be against us and it's with that you have emboldened us and we talk, take on that responsibility and verse 29 reveals that. And now, now, and now, Lord, consider their threat, their threats, and grant that your servants may speak your way word with boldness. Do you recall the title of our lesson is boldness, emboldened. And verse 30, while you while you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word boldly. Now you recall when Pentecost occurred and God made himself known with tongues of fire lighting on the people. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in the language of those gathered there and it was people from all over that region of the world. And it was these unlearned men that were used at that time to speak boldly and they spoke in a language they did not know and people heard or the people heard them in the language of their birth but here they are empowered by the holy spirit and they began to spur, speak word the word of god boldly to those who were gathered there now uh one of the things that I see in this next verse goes back to uh, uh, one of our previous lessons where uh, it is also on Pentecost that we see that the people were united in a way that they never were. You recall that at um, the mountain when the law was given, there were 3,000 people who died. 
on the day of Pentecost and and and, and that died, but then also you remember at the Tower of Babel that the languages were divided so that the world was divided in linguistic groups. Here on this occasion, the people were united in hearing, but then further they were united, as this text will tell us, were united of one heart and mind. Verse 32, now the entire group of those who believe were of one heart and mind. And they, at this moment, had one purpose in mind, and that was to proclaim Christ, proclaim the good news, but also to live the good news, to care for one another. And at this point, he points out that no one claimed that any of the possessions were their own, but instead they held everything in common. Now, this is not communism. This is a common way of sharing things to be sure that everyone was cared for. We see that evident when they gathered for their agape meal and what we call is the agape feast. Those who brought the potluck dinners, who had something to bring, bought, brought an abundance. Those who did not have food to bring came and they received the abundance out of the abundance that others had. They were not compelled to do this. They volunteered because they were united in both heart, there is the compassion, but also in purpose as they knew what the mind of God was and what they were to, to do. Verse 3, 33, with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on all of them. Again, we are reminded that it is not by our merit or achievement that we have the power of the resurrection, but it is by that grace of God, the unmerited love and favor of God, that all of us are able to have that. But the power of the resurrection is that to which the uh, apostles and all of us return to again and again as the demonstration and the evidence that God is able to give us boldness and strength to do his work. And then he goes on to describe how outwardly and inwardly these people are provided for. For there was not a needy person among them because of all those who owned lands or businesses sold them and brought the proceeds out of what was sold. And it was brought there in order to provide for the, these people. Uh, then Peter, going back to the other text, then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to the brothers and, and uh, people and the elders, if we were um, uh, ever examined today about a good deed done to this disabled man, by what means he was healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that the, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, again, punching them in the gut, whom you crucified and God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here. There is a word used for standing that is, we are to take a stand, to stand as this man, as evidence and testimony to what God did for him. And we do the same. In the Old Testament, you may remember that when Boaz was addressed as the kinsman redeemer, it was said of him that he was a man of standing. Truthfully, he stood as a man, but inwardly, he lived 
character without the character of God. And when we stand up and do and are emboldened as we have been instructed to, we have character that not only is outward, but it is inward. And both are taken uh, and noticed uh, for people who follow Christ. But also he reminds them he's standing here in the evidence of the risen power of Christ. And he stands there to declare that. And then they use what I just, you know, what we talked about in terms of the stone the builders rejected. And you remember that illustration. And I think that's a good thing to go back to and use at this section with the people. And so uh, they, the truth was revealed. Here's a man uh, that's standing out of the grace, grace of God healed. But it's because of the one you rejected uh, that this has occurred. And he is the one by which we are saved. He is reminding us to be filled with the Holy Spirit means that we are empowered to speak as was Peter. It also means that we must rely on the Holy Spirit. There are lessons that each of, one, each of us learn in our walk with Christ, that there are times when we say we can't do certain things for him, and then we have the evidence of that spirit coming before us and then as he was empowered he spoke to the tribunal council and it ought to be we ought to be reminded that he will give us the strength to face those that we know will reject us as they did in that early day they rejected jesus and those who followed him they considered the foundation stone in building the temple as flawed, unfit, and they rejected him. But then they came to realize that that stone, even though it had been cast aside, was the very one that became the, the, the cornerstone. And Peter's message is clear and should be clear to the world that it's only through Jesus Christ that one can come to salvation. John uh, 14, 6, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. The truth was uh, revealed. It was delivered by, by and through uh, Peter and John, those men that they considered to be uh, uh, in opposition but then when they preached that and presented it these people had nothing to say in opposition and I believe when we show the evidence in our life by the character of our life because of the power that comes to us through the Holy Spirit and when we are able to stand with well, that kind of suit on, people will take notice, not of us, but of Jesus. And uh, they, then as a result of that, obviously they were speechless. Uh, what should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them. And I think we live in a day when we ought to be giving of uh, that kind of message, and people will say, well, we cannot deny uh, what truth is revealed. And uh, that truth was revealed, and that testimony was given. Here in the sight of, of these people, it was unstoppable, and these people recognized that they were to give the glory to God over what had been done and uh, we stop with that message to say that we have been emboldened to speak in a world that would be against us, a message of good news that is unstoppable. And when we stop 
God will empower us to continue going. Thank you for listening, and I hope you can use this material as you teach yourself.